And so when you're dealing with the entire sphere of knowledge, knowledge production, we can see that it has taken a shape with the emergence of active domains of production and comparison. And <coughs> there are three spheres, basically. <coughs> One is the informal open source communicative ecology. The second is a regulatory system, both informal and formal, which are assigning values to the knowledge. And third would be the commercial knowledge markets formalized in conventional terms. Now, let me uh, get back to uh, some of numbers just to put India, just to situate India in the global map. In this particular table, what I have intended to show, that the gross expenditure on R&D compared to China, Russia, Brazil, South Africa, UK, and United States, the percentage of GDP. So if you find the India, the second column after the year, we find that it has more or less remained stable after reaching a peak in 2006. I, I, I don't have the time series, but broadly we can say that it has more or less remained stable. China, we have had a very rapid growth from 0 0.56 to 2.07. I'll get back to China in the next slide. Russia, you can see there's an increase, marginal of course. Brazil, more or less the same. South Africa, more or less the same. USA is of course hovering around 2.8. <coughs> And UK, there's a slight increase. So what we find, I mean, I'm tempted to compare with, with, with China, that once it was being, uh, I mean, it is still being considered, I mean, in the, in the circle, that China would overtake USA when it comes to the gross spending on R&D. Uh, China has targeted 2.5, but USA, we saw that it's around 2.8, but China might overtake over a period of time. What is important here? that 8% of China's R&D goes to the universities, which is half of USA's. This comparison is important. And most of the R&D resources are dedicated for the state-controlled enterprises that is argued to be driving the Chinese economy. And a part of this, in fact, I don't have a table, but the China, in terms of the publication in the English uh, medium, journals, uh, had a very fast growth, 15.4% or so, annual rate of growth. And this expenditure, 8% is earmarked for the universities, but the remaining would ultimately trickle down to the universities, and that is spurring the growth in, the, in, in terms of the publication. This table is meant for India alone, and here we see the sector-wise composition of gross expenditure on R&D, higher education, government, and business enterprises. And the last row shows what was presented in the last table, that is the expenditure on R&D as a percentage of GDP. So in terms of composition, what we find that for higher education, it's a marginal increase from 3.4 to almost around 4%. Government share has come down from 74% to 53%. And business enterprises has actually witnessed a rise. I will get back to the why business enterprises could be explained. We'll get back to later. It is almost from 23% to 43%. This is the compositional change when it comes to the overall expenditure that you are spending on R&D by these three entities. Uh, <coughs> what is the scenario in the higher education sector today? Based on the previous NAC report, it could be safely argued that almost two-thirds of our universities and the 90% of our colleges are below average. But when you're comparing what percentage of GERD are being allocated for higher education, we find in the OECD is around 20%. China, I've already mentioned 8%, Japan, 15%, and India is around 4%. So China is hovering around 8 to 10%, I can see. And <coughs> so the 55% of total expenditure are for the science agencies and the government funded labs. But when you're looking at the overall higher education system in India, we have to understand that the center state disparities in funding university education is pretty huge. The central funded universities are pretty well off, but the state universities are finding it very difficult under the fiscal regime, which believes in uh, fiscal deficit, uh, I mean, restriction of fiscal deficit in terms of the GDP. <coughs> now, how world over, you know, when you're trying to look at how do you channelize resources for R&D, these are the two major strategies that we find. but. I will see the reflection of these two strategies in the Indian context. One would be <coughs> you're using the competition to drive differentiation 
and concentration in the existing top institutions. So, the idea would be that you reward the quality, let there be competition, competition would lead to a valuation of the university and valuation of the university would attract funding from the government and government would say that look you have done well, so you should better be funded. And the second would be that you choose the universities, you build new capacities in the old and new and this is called picking the winners. But the Indian scenario, I can safely argue that both the uh, strategies are being adopted. Uh, on the one hand, we have, I mean in the second one, the easy example would be some of the funds that our department gets and the University of Potential for Excellence and research uh, and the DSA and CAS at the center. Uh, and the rewarding quality is, has not yet been implemented, but this is being mooted to be implemented. This is in the form of the graded autonomy, which has been already mooted by UGC. And when it comes to the picking the winners, the government of India initially it conceptualized world class universities, but now they have replaced the world class university, saying that we should set up, the government has said we should uh, set up 20 Indian Institute of Eminence, ultimately with the objective to occupy space in global higher education and 10 from the private and 10 from the public. This is important because the entire university system is being categorized. So, that the resources would be channelized based on their potential based on the performances and this is how the future when you are looking at the teaching research and <coughs> research concentration within the university system, these are the policies which will play a very important role. I do not know whether it is going to be implemented, but it is being, uh, I mean, there is a possibility. So, the, 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 these are the three categories of the university, category 1, category 2 and category 3 and category 1, the NAC score beyond 3.5 on above or ranking the national institutional ranking framework, the top 50 and the category 2 between 3 and 5 and category 3. I am not going into the details of the policies, but what it uh, seeks to argue that the category 1 would have the freedom to determine the fees to recruit the foreign faculty to have 20 to 30 percent of the students from abroad. There will be many more such changes and incentivization of the faculty salary. So, it will be all these category 1 universities will be restructured in a radically different way. Now, let me, uh, th 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 uh, I mean overall, uh, what are the changes being taking place with regard to the third? Do I have time? And two minutes. Very briefly, <coughs> this is the mode of funding and you can see here that the two questions are being important. I will not elaborate on this. One is that <coughs> what is being funded, whether the input is being funded or output is being funded. For JNU, for example, it is the input which is being mainly funded because the teacher salaries are being directly credited by the MHRD. But increasingly, if you look at the uh, this pattern of funding, which has implication for the conduct of research and the research outcome, we are moving from input based funding to the output based funding when it comes to what is being funded and how is it being funded, you are moving from a centralized to a more market based, uh, market based. And each of these therefore, will have different in, in implication for autonomy in doing research and autonomy in what we teach. And so therefore, the mode of funding will change or will influence the behavior of the scientists and the teachers and accordingly what we do and what we intend to come up with. Uh, in the global university ranking very briefly, <coughs> the time is short, what is happening that there is a concentration of the best of the minds, the teachers and the students at the top of the ranking. So, therefore, when you look at the world ranking, it is very, very stable and this is how the top of the universities are in a position to attract the best of the minds and huge amount of resource funding. The endowment of Harvard, MIT, Rochester would be pretty large and they have got the best of the people. So, the market and the global ranking in fact, they are reinforcing each other to stabilize or consolidate this particular hierarchy <coughs> in, the, in the system. And in a one way, when the universities are being rewarded for original research because it is a peer reviewed publication, uh, but at the same time market is getting into the realm of the university a bit later. Uh, uh, briefly about autonomy in doing research in social sciences. Uh, very briefly, I will not go by point by point, but what is important here, who is funding is very important and what objective the funding agency has in undertaking or in commissioning a social science research project is very, very important. Because 
Increasingly, we find the emergence of the think tanks, particularly privately funded, and government is also increasingly relying on the think tank to undertake research. So, therefore, the think tanks are playing a larger role, and the objective of the funding agency is very, very important because in social sciences, we very often locate ourselves within a theoretical paradigm to do research. And this choice of theoretical paradigm has got very serious implication for the policies that we undertake. The last two slides very briefly. And this intuition of the market forces in the realm of the university has got very serious implication for the conduct and the research outcome. This is a study based on India, a very recent study, Mitra and Sharma, <laughs> Cambridge University Press book. They are saying that look, a part of the increase in a part of the increase in expenditure on R and D where the business sector could be explained by that the business sector have resorted to manipulation of what is permissible for tax benefit calculation, for tax exemption. What they do, they include the manpower under the item what is called, what is actually meant for innovation. So, is it, it is very easy to inflate the expenditure by including the manpower expenses and which is not actually innovation, but they get the tax benefit. So, this is an unfair practice that they are saying and what we find that the studies indicate that since the technology is largely imported from abroad, there are a lot of cost involved in installation of the machine and absorption of the technology, but these expenditure are not helping uh, other than the tax benefit at all, <coughs> this industry. In the context of the US, uh, Washburn 2005, <coughs> corporate corruption of higher education, arguing that look, uh, it is not a problem that university and industry are working together in when it comes to the funding of research and what, what they do, but the problem is that the distinction between industry and academia is not very strict, it is getting blood. Some of the examples from Washburn, universities market faculty, their invention to earn royalty and profit, they invest their endowment money in risky startup, venture capital all of you know, run the industrial park and for profit companies. And some of these problems appear in social sciences also, but more about sciences. So, the corporate funding when it is being directed to the university, they come with strings attached. So, therefore, there is a natural tendency of the part of the faculty at the university to cede control over the research to these companies. And it has, there are many examples in that book by Washpan, the suppression of information regarding health rates, delayed publication and, uh, and most of the universities are spending in US, but only two dozen universities, around 24, 25 universities have been able to succeed. So, but the lot of resources are going into this. Faculty are paid to endorse the product, put their names on the papers, goes written by the industry. <coughs> Non-tenure jobs is a very serious problem because they are emitting adverse signal to the researcher. Internship time has gone up, that is why, and to the teaching community. Increased propensity for undertaking safe project rather than less fundable ones with uncertain but potentially path breaking outcomes. Teaching as a, in, in the process is getting ignored. Humanities and social sciences are getting less budgetary allocation, predatory journals, particularly in India I am talking about, is a serious compromise with the quality. Let me end by this, uh, Dasgupta and David. Economists understand technology less deeply than some might hope, but they understand the world of technology far better than they do the world of science. Thank you. Yeah, please, please. Please, please. No, 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 sorry, sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Did you drop Shumpita purposely or did you think Shumpita? I had Shumpita in the earlier, but in this PowerPoint, Shumpita creative destruction, I, uh, I, I deleted. Now I find I should not have. It was on the second slide, yeah. I mean, of course, I should have referred to the Shumpita because how, you know, this creative destruction can explain not only growth, but the in, in industry's dedication of resources for innovation and, and particular. Yeah. Sorry. Between Professor Drew Renner's talk and your talk, because somewhere he ended by saying that we are now witnessing a systemic shift 
for say at least past 20, 30 years and I think uh, that is very true uh, in the world of science and technology. And with you, uh, your presentation especially got to the economics of it um, and the funding part of it, I think it actually uh, brought it out very well, uh, you know, it illustrated further what this shift is like. But somewhere, I think some of these things can be said much more forcefully and it's not just with technology, but even science these days has become a commodity. And there are several scholars who have worked on how science needs to be seen as a commodity in recent times. Yes, okay, thank you so much. Uh, not having a PowerPoint presentation. So I hope you'll bear with me uh, for that. Uh, my presentation today uh, leads off from a paper I presented at, a, uh, at an earlier workshop organized by Dhruv at uh, the Institute of Advanced Studies in Shimla, where uh, I was focusing on uh, the problems of and the need for rural industrialization and the application of science and technology towards that end. And I was bemoaning the fact that uh, there has been so little uh, of research in the science and technology fields leading towards rural industrialization, which uh, was a great pity since there is a clear need in terms of job creation value creation in the rural economy in a context of declining uh, employment in agriculture, jobless growth uh, in industry, and the presence of a substantial population in the rural areas who are carriers of indigenous scientific and technological knowledge in our country. But uh, there was this big vacuum uh, of uh, research work in science and technology. And I had speculated that perhaps uh, this was due to an inbuilt prejudice or bias uh, in the upper class, upper caste milieu of uh, academic research, of planning, of administrative uh, work with regard to the uh, lower caste, lower class, manual work based universe inhabited by the artisans and the working people and others in our country. Uh, I'm just giving you this background because this is going to link up uh, with my presentation today and may give you a little clue as to uh, where my thinking is uh, coming from. Uh, I would be today looking at uh, the universe of uh, creating or upgrading skills and thinking about uh, related jobs and livelihoods. And uh, I think you would appreciate that under the present government, this seems to have or ostensibly has acquired salience with a large number of governmental programs and a fair amount of expenditure being incurred on the Skill India and many such other uh, initiatives. Uh, while looking at this, therefore, skilling, education, and livelihoods, I'll focus on four aspects during the course of my presentation. And Dhruv, I'll request you to give me a signal when there is five minutes left. OK? Well, Chairman, sir. Uh, yeah. Uh, 
the first factor, of course, uh, is what I believe to be an absence of a, uh, an employment uh, ecosystem or, and human resource planning within which skill upgradation uh, could be thought of and planned uh, for. For example, as I said, uh, a program of rural industrialization based on processing and manufacture related to rural produce, which would have given a significant shift uh, or a boost to the rural sector in the uh, economic value chain. However, even in the organized industry, there is little evidence in India of envisaging or planning for demand of skilled workers, particularly in the manufacturing sector, which has essentially broadly been left to fend for itself. Uh, in the morass of market forces and the international division of labor. For instance, economists have been talking in the last five years of China now looking to climb rapidly up the value uh, ladder, moving away from low-cost manufacture to high-tech uh, manufacture, which is going to leave a vacuum uh, in the manufacturing segment worldwide. But India does not seem to be positioning itself anywhere in ste stepping into this uh, uh, breach. A big lament, as you would know, of foreign as well as Indian uh, investors, besides lack of infrastructure, is the dearth of a skilled workforce uh, in India for modern manufacturing uh, industries. And the extent infrastructure and institutional structures that we have in terms of ITIs and PPP institutions for uh, skill development and training are clearly inadequate and are unable to meet the demand. Even in sectors like automotive uh, manufacturing, each industry is today cannibalizing from the other because there is a shortage of a, a pool of manpower being uh, generated. The second aspect I'd like to focus on is that in this universe that I'm talking about, there has been, not just today, but over the past 40, 50 years, a calamitous separation between knowledge and education on the one hand, and skills and training on the other. There is such a firewall between these two, uh, which again, if I may speculate, may once again be ascribed to a Brahminical or upper caste sharp distinction between intellectual work and manual uh, labor. For example, the entire educational system comes under the Ministry of Human Resource Development. The entire skill and training infrastructure comes under the Ministry of Labor. So this assumes that skills has nothing to do with uh, education, that in fact, the person who cannot be educated or the person who is uneducated is incapable of absorbing further education and therefore should just do skills. Uh, and if you think of the vocational stream of education in India, that's how it is designed. If you failed in class 10, you're not a good student, beta, then you go to the vocational stream because education is not for you. you uh, learn to do some manual uh, skills. This compares very poorly with any uh, advanced industrial uh, society where if you look at Europe or the US, increasingly at China, not to mention Japan, Malaysia, you have infrastructure for skill development which allows for a continuous back and forth between skills training and education, theoretical uh, knowledge, filtering back and forth, allowing you through your career to be able to come back and forth between acquiring skills, gaining more education, 
which enriches your skills further, enables you to climb the career ladder and so on. In India, this is not so. Once you are vocational and skill-based, that's it. You end up with, as a plumber or a carpenter or an electrician and you are not informed by any further upgradation in knowledge or education. As you would well appreciate, this is not going to work in a uh, society that aspires to become an industrialized uh, middle income uh, country. Uh, India does have an apprenticeship program, but which is widely regarded as a failure and has just not worked either in creating the necessary skills or in being able to combine uh, skills with a program of uh, education. Uh, just on a personal note, let me just add that uh, in the late 60s, I spent four years in the United Kingdom uh, doing an apprenticeship with Rolls-Royce Aero Engines uh, Limited. Spent four years there, did my degree. I would spend 30 weeks of the year in college, 20 weeks of the year in the factory. After one full year of basic skills uh, training and would go back and forth between college and industry acquired to acquire a wide range of skills in that particular uh, industry where I was working before I had done my first job. Uh, and I was not, uh, uh, I, I was quite typical uh, in this and along with me in the college were uh, students, apprentices who had entered the apprenticeship program with different levels of scholastic achievement, therefore adapted to different levels of training, went back and upgraded their educational competences and came back at a higher level in skills training. There is no such uh, arrangement or institutional facility available in the country. The third aspect I would deal with is, uh, there has been a tacit assumption in India right from the sixth plan onwards. When we used to have a, a program called TRISEM, which was training, training of youth for self-employment. The TRISEM framework of skills development and training continues, I believe, till this day, where it is assumed that you provide training to a person and then that person will automatically then establish himself as a tradesman. The idea that you acquire a set of skills and you become a tradesman, I believe, makes two wrong assumptions. One is, that this can be done purely by acquiring physical or manual uh, skills without a complement of knowledge-based uh, education. And second, that it just requires training to convert your learning into a trade, which would be then a self-employed uh, person like a carpenter, etc., whom you have, but without the modern requirements of certification of standards, of being able to upgrade uh, these skills. In that absence, the training that you do is rendered ineffective in the employment or livelihoods markets, and that's a problem that persists uh, even today. Uh, fourth uh, issue I would deal with is, I've been so far talking about skills and the lack of education to go with those skills among the working population, the working classes, whether it's rural or urban. I believe we also are facing a crisis in the opposite uh, end of the spectrum. That is in our engineers and technical personnel not having enough skills. Uh, if you look around you at the IITs uh, and the engineering colleges we have in our country, 
with increased privatization of engineering colleges, most of them underfunded, uh, with poor faculty, with just four walls and a few notes being given to students. Students have no exposure to practical uh, knowledge and training and skills whatsoever. That's at one end of the engineering spectrum. At the other end of the engineering spectrum in the IITs, 80% uh, or more of IIT students just end up doing coding. Uh, very little engineering work is done there. Very little research work in engineering is done at the IITs in any case. Uh, and once again, all large multinational corporations, including in the IT sector, bemoan the fact that there is so little research uh, uh, being done at the engineering institutions uh, in our country. Uh, by the way, it's very interesting to note that it's a peculiarity in India that we have engineers with five years spent in engineering colleges who then become coders, uh, writing, uh, writing code uh, for apps and various other programs. Most coders internationally don't go through a five-year engineering course. And the reason for this only is the United States first started tightening admissions into uh, the country to restrict immigration, they thought it would be a good idea to say you must have at least five years of college education before we give you an H-1B visa to enter the country. That's when Indian graduate engineers started going uh, to the US. There's no necessity for it uh, to do so, but you go through five years of IIT and end up being coders with very little uh, emphasis in uh, engineering skills. Incidentally, ISRO has a more or less informal policy of not recruiting students from the IITs into ISRO because they believe they are too academic and are desk jockeys, if you like, without uh, the necessary uh, skills uh, in hard engineering and prefer to do their recruitment from the National Institutes of Technology from the NITs than from the uh, IIT uh, system itself. So let me conclude by uh, highlighting four points. One is that I believe the entire architecture of the skills program in India needs to be reconceptualized and reimagined and reconfigured. Uh, both for rural industrialization, which I believe is still a vital necessity, and also for a major leap in the manufacturing sector, which India badly uh, needs. But this will necessitate a break, uh, a decisive break from the caste class biases that our entire educational uh, system and job creation system has uh, today, which is centered around a segregated conceptual uh, conception of manual work and intellectual work. Uh, the, the former manual work being considered uh, demeaning uh, for a certain class of people and intellectual work being considered out of the reach of uh, the lower classes, uh, if you like. Uh, this break uh, would necessarily have to lead to a rethink in terms of a synergized education come skill uh, based system with provision for lateral entry into both the education system and the skill system at different stages of one's uh, career. And third, an earlier speaker spoke about the scientific temper and the need to build that in India. Uh, I've often wondered why we tend to use the term science and scientific uh, 
as an embracing category to also include technology. Uh, and I believe that um, while, the center, while the scientific <laughs> temper in terms of critical thinking and a rational outlook and so on are certainly badly needed, I believe a, if I can coin a term, a technological temper is I think as important uh, in India. Uh, where we still, uh, for the smallest work that comes up in plumbing or electricals or uh, whatever in the domestic sector, immediately reach for our phone to call the nearest service technician and are incapable of doing the simplest jobs uh, for ourselves. Uh, when I was an apprentice uh, in England, uh, my landlady's 14-year-old son could strip a car engine and put it back together because that's how kids grew and grew with an imagination and a capability of being able to handle uh, technical jobs and not finding anything demeaning uh, about it. I think we need to cultivate that in our country. Thank you very much. Oh, sure. Sorry, 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 sir. Yeah. It was here, no? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Counter observations. I have noted that in workmanship in India, the older workers who learn their skills in kind of guild environment, you know, uh, they were very particular about the kinds of things they worked. So quality of what came out was often higher. Now the expansion of the of the workforce, kind of chalta attitude has, you know, really become very strong. So the workmanship is completely not up to the previous generation level. So it's a kind of, uh, of course, it doesn't answer your question that you know you need a more uh, knowledge and technology interface to develop the working skill. But something else is also there, which is also a factor in what kind of work gets done in India. Uh, yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I think I'll respond to that, yeah. Uh, yes, what you say is right, in the sense that if you speak of the earlier generations having better quality of workmanship, it possibly comes from a greater focus and expertise in that area, whereas today your base has become broadened, but with uh, a shallower depth in terms of uh, skills. I remember one of the carpenters I was working with in a construction uh, site once pointed to a drawer which a junior fresh carpenter had made, and he showed the drawer to me and pointed to the fact that it did not have one right angle in any of the four corners. <laughs> uh, and this is not uh, uncommon, uh, I think. Uh, today, I, there's just a few trades, particularly where employment abroad is going to be called for, where people are beginning to insist on standards and certification. This has not yet reached the desired levels. You would still go and pay 25,000 rupees for a couple of hours of hiring a hall like this at India Habitat Center or wherever, and you will still find the wires connecting the amplifier to the power socket with two naked wires thrust into the plug with a matchstick holding them in. I mean, this is... Uh, Sir, I have a question. Yes. yes. Uh, now, you talked about the... Uh, lack of a linkage between education and skills. Yeah. Uh, you know, doesn't the vocational education uh, system launched by CBSC um, prove to be a solution or I won't say solution, prove to bridge this gap uh, between education and skills? And my second question is, uh, with this growing emphasis on skill training, we have a huge funding for 
uh, skill development programs. But the my primary objective behind such funding is not to meet the uh, human resource needs of India's industry, but to train them and send them abroad. Uh, how would you, uh, you know, comment on these two policy measures? Yeah. yeah. Uh, very briefly on the vocational uh, education part, I'm afraid I don't agree that the vocational uh, stream encourages the synergy between education and skills. In fact, it just tries to meet a formal requirement. You drop out of uh, formal schooling at the 10th grade, you shift to a vocational stream, and just to say that you have crossed a 12th standard level, you do some uh, little bit of education there. But the point I was really making is your education needs to be linked to your skills so that your skills can go up and climb to different levels backed by the education and the theoretical knowledge you receive with respect uh, to that. This cannot happen the way we develop our vocational education today. Say for example, uh, China is now moving away from, let's say, manufacturing toys to manufacturing high-tech equipment. The workers that are needed for that would not only have to have physical skills, but need to have a fair amount of theoretical knowledge of engineering uh, and engineering systems as well, which they need to be given, which our vocational system does not provide. Second thing about skill upgradation, uh, about the skill training program, training people for positions abroad, I'm afraid I don't agree. Uh, for two reasons. One is, bulk of the skill training we do here is inadequate to enable employment in uh, uh, OECD countries or the northern countries. In fact, just two days ago, government has announced a very ambitious program of sending half a million Indian youth to Japan to work for three years there under the Japanese conditions so that they could acquire uh, necessary skills and capacities of working in those in that environment and then coming back in which case they'll probably find themselves as square pegs in round holes uh, having worked. So I don't think yet we are uh, training people to be able to work uh, abroad. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Right, Ginger? Here. Oh. Okay, okay, take all right. Uh, let me first of all thank Dhruv for asking me to uh, come here and participate in this very interesting seminar or workshop. And the involvement with the journal has been interesting because you get to meet all kinds of people. It's supposed to be a dialogue. And uh, that is the spirit in which I am going to say a few things. Uh, to begin with, I must uh, tell you, give a disclaimer that I am not a professional working in the field of uh, education in terms of studying education. I am a professional physicist who does quantum physics, but has been involved with this uh, setting up of Isar Mohali over the past one decade. And in that period, certain uh, thoughts and ideas have come to my mind, which I have crystallized in some form. And therefore, the presentation is going to be somewhat informal and also in the spirit of sharing experiences and views and prejudices than to uh, a well thought out paper to be, to be read out. So with that disclaimer, uh, I will begin. Uh, first of all, I would like to say that the previous two presentations have been of immense help for my presentation. And uh, I did not know that this would happen. Maybe Dhruv knew that beforehand. 
because he was putting the jigsaw together and I am a piece in that. So, uh, I am going to talk about uh, uh, the recent initiatives in science education which we have seen and I think a very good backdrop has been already provided by Shomin, but I will provide backdrop in an informal way to uh, make my final point, uh, which I kind of decided I will not make in the title. So, the title I have kept as Transforming Indian Science, Recent Initiatives in Science Education. So, it is a very neutral title, but you will see that as we move towards conclusions, they are not going to be so, so neutral. Uh, the, the, so, I am going to make this kind of discrete point. So, while thinking about uh, initiatives in higher education or in science education, one must connect it with higher education at large and then with education in general and that I do not think has been happening. Let me give you an example. The particular example of initiatives that I am going to talk about today are IISCRs, Indian Institutes of Science Education and Research, where the first thing which has been realized is that all sciences should be kind of put together, physics, chemistry, mathematics, biology, part of social sciences, this, that, so on. One should have a broad based undergraduate science education. But in 11th and 12th, there is people who take mathematics do not take biology, people who take biology do not take mathematics, which means the there is no link between the two policies. So, it is a one set of planning ha happening at one level, another set of planning happening at another level. And people who think about science education many times say, no, 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 science is very different from humanities and social sciences. And uh, so, this kind of a thing that science education, uh, the framework has to be of higher education and of education at large is many times missing uh, from the even the theoretical discourses, let alone the practical implementations. Then uh, uh, Raghu put these things in his own way and I had put it in, I am going to put it in my own way that once you talk about education, immediately one talks about uh, literacy. So, some people are literate and some people are illiterate. And uh, I always ask this question to all kinds of audiences. We all enjoy music, but how much, how many of us are able to uh, break it into notes and kind of write it down, which means are we literate, can we read and write music and most people are not. But that is not at all considered illiteracy. Whereas, if you are not able to read and write in English, that is a serious drawback. If you can, at least in some Indian language, if you can read and write, you are literate. So, the notion of literacy itself needs to be questioned and I think that was, the point was made very uh, in some detail by Raghu. Similarly, crafts. If I cannot uh, measure and make something, he was talking about carpenters and that is why my favorite example, that somebody who is illiterate but is able to make a table, is able to measure, is able to divide, is able to cut, is able to join. We say well, that illiterate carpenter came and made this table for me. On the other hand, somebody who can write with pen and paper is literate. Uh, agriculture, I mean people, farmers are definitely those illiterate farmers. Most of India is full of illiterate farmers. And that is why we have been trying to teach them uh, agriculture through agriculture universities. And we do not never talk about the fact that for thousands of years uh, in northern India, for example, there has been no famine. That means people knew how to do agriculture in a sustainable way over, over thousands of years. And within 50 years of Green Revolution, we are talking about you know agriculture coming into a crisis and so on and so forth. So, well, that is not the point I am making today. But my point is that notion of literacy itself needs to be redefined. And uh, we have to be much more open and broad in interpreting literacy itself. Uh, of course, he, Raghu talked about certain uh, interpretations of this, why this is so and so on. Now, uh, coming to science, I just want to flash few categories uh, in front of you. Uh, I may not comment too much on them, but you will see uh, the way I have put it, uh, what I am trying to say and in the discussion part, we can come back to them. So, science is modern and traditional and I think we should uh, look at both, like knowledge. I mean, the science here can be replaced uh, by knowledge if you, if you wish. So, we, we have this bias towards modern science and uh, traditional science, sometimes we do not uh, mm, kind of traditionalists own it and as scientists we do not own it and I think we should own both. Uh, so, so, that balance I think we need to have. In India particularly, we need to look at science also uh, in terms of colonial and free. I mean, 
institutions and scientific things which happened after 1947 and before because that was a big uh, watershed. Science also needs to be looked at uh, in categories like Eastern and Western in terms of uh, origins, thoughts, way of thinking and arriving at uh, conclusions and so on. Although we talk about uh, universal, universal scientific method, but there could be colors and variations of that method which might be uh, cultural and connected to different cultures and we must be kind of sensitive to those aspects also and respect them all. And of course, the uh, very important one which we will come, I will come back to is individual versus institutionalized because science uh, could be done individually uh, maybe up till 19th century or beginning of 20th century, but more or less science is now an institutionalized uh, activity. And the last category is technocratic and human. So, there is a technocratic part generating technologies, making profits, all that and so on. But then after all, it is the human beings who do science and trying to expand boundaries of knowledge and all that and so on. So, a balance between or a, a sensitivity towards these also should be there while talking about science or science education and so on and so forth. So, with that backdrop, uh, I very want briefly want to talk about the uh, because science is taught in Indian universities primarily and I think Shoman did a much more detailed discussion of the universities. But I want to make my point by saying that we had a few universities up to 1947. You could count them on, on fingers. Uh, then uh, after 1947, we had a proliferation of universities. The I call it the rise of Indian uh, university system where every state universities were created and departments were created and there was a whole growth period of the university system. Uh, well, in 19, some people say 1970s, but I would say 1980s, the decline of the university system already had kind of begun. And there is a, a lot of discussion on that from mid 70s to 1990s, what kind of decline happened. But that decline was of a different character. Uh, because a, when something is set up, you start with certain momentum, there could be loss of momentum, there could be inbreeding, there could be production of lots of uh, uh, graduates which were not employed. So, one could have thought that that might oscillate in some way. So, that is kind of uh, understanding people uh, would have had. But in 1991, when the uh, university funding was cut very seriously uh, by, the, by the economic policy which came then I think uh, the decline kind of went into a decay because uh, fee structure went, uh, most universities went through a 10 times hike of fees in 1991. And I just did a very informal study of one university that led to a very different kind of people coming into the, the university for education and so on and so forth. So, that decline um, of, I mean the, the, the kind of issues which was happening in 1970s and 1980s, uh, instead of going through an oscillation and reworking through uh, internal all that and so on, went through a decline because a damping force came as a serious fund cut into higher education. And in 21st century, I think uh, Indian university system is into a sphere crisis, the public one, uh, because the emphasis is now on private universities. To give you an example, uh, I was surprised that uh, seven, eight years ago, uh, President of India went to a lovely professional university for their convocation and gave the degrees. Hamid Din Sari came from uh, Afghanistan. I was just look, I started looking at the data. Has he ever come to uh, Guru Nanak Dev University, Amritsar, President of India? No. Pro Punjabi University, Patiala. The government created universities have never had a President of India coming. But a Jalandhar, uh, a Punjab, the lovely professional university President of India went for their convocation. So, that tells you uh, that the rug is being pulled from the public university system. And uh, then I saw a very interesting development. The Department of Science and Technology co uh, organized the um, Children's National Children's Science Congress in a private university. And that university does not even have a science program. It is actually a glorified engineering college, but they hosted the Ch National Children's Science Congress. So, that is another indicator that government and funding agencies and all that are going to basically uh, kind of not really look towards uh, universities which are in the public domain and the privatization is going to take over. Since time is limited, there is a uh, few other examples I have which I can share privately how this is kind of happening, but I think uh, you know what I am saying. Of course, uh, this slide is kind of uh, uh, just for completion that while these universities were going through this proliferation and uh, uh, 
decline and crisis, something else was also happening. Uh, we had, you know, TIFR was created, the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Department of Atomic Energy played a major role in science in India, ISRO started its activities. CSIR existed before 1947, but it became much bigger uh, after independence. And then of course, IITs were uh, created about which uh, Raghu already talked about. So, um, the original mandate was to create indigenous technology for Indian society, but as uh, I also share that view, they ended up creating graduates for the western countries and so on. But they had their impact on standardizing certain kind of education, standardize, bringing in certain standards and so on and so forth. So, this so one was the university's creation in a bigger higher education arena and these were the elite science institutions which also got created and got nurtured and developed uh, in, in past 50, 60, 60, 70 years. This is the backdrop in which these new initiatives uh, come forward. Uh, five visors were created in 2006-2008. Uh, these are called Indian Institutes of Science Education and Research. So, I will say a little bit more about these because you may not be familiar with the, uh, the details. Two more were created in 2009-10. So, total there are seven institutes called Indian Institutes of Science Education and Research. Now, they have a mandate to be the lead institutions for science, pure sciences, where uh, IIT like education, undergraduate education for science students is combined with the cutting edge research to bring in uh, a, a complete sea change in the arena of science in India, that is the mandate. Uh, these institutions take about 1500 students after 12th every year and then they undergo training for 5 years, broad based science education for first 2 years specialized science education in a specific science for next two years and one year research and several apprentices and summer programs and all that and so on and so forth. Uh, IITs of course they existed but uh, 16 new IITs were created in 2008, a major change. Uh, so 16 new IITs we had and 30 new central universities were created roughly in the same period. Now on the one hand we see that uh, as I said that the state is pulling rug out of higher education, but why, what are these initiatives all about? So, some of you would be better qualified to study this, why this is happening and uh, so on and so forth. But I want to only say one thing that uh, we now have something called Sarv Siksha Abhyan, SSA. I do not know whether you have heard about it. Similarly, we have Madhmik Shiksha Abhyan, there is the two major projects which government of India says that uh, is going to revolutionize the primary and the elementary education in India. On the other hand, the rug has been is being pulled from the public school system. So, public uh, most schools are, uh, uh, government schools are becoming defunct. There is a major shift towards privatization of school education, but we have these iconic projects. I think something similar is happening with higher education. The rug is being pulled from the state funded universities. I mean, uh, to just give you an example, and this is not at all an atypical example. Two weeks ago, I was at the Kavimpu University in Karnataka, which is a typical Indian state university. Physics department has three faculty members, chemistry department has four faculty members, Kavimpu University has four faculty members in Canada, okay. And no department has more than four is very large number of faculty members per department, one, two, three. And then they hire some people for a year and they run the show. And this is the situation. But on the other hand, we are creating all these institutions, uh, which I call, which are new initiatives, which are supposed to revamp and revolutionize and uh, all that and so on. I do not know how I am doing with time. Uh, five minutes. Okay, so now I have to be clear. So now let me come to, see, I think that these new uh, initiatives are basically, uh, there is a, this is elitism in them with the new face. I will justify that uh, in a minute. There is a lack of vision and lack of paradigm. Now, uh, well, let, let me move on. So, there is a very interesting Planning Commission document of 1987, which talks about science education, which in some sense uh, says that uh, you have, you create elite institutions, few of them to standardize science education for 0.5 percent to 1 percent of students, <coughs> tier 1. Tier 2 is aimed at 16 percent of students, which will be done in uh, collaboration with other institutions, which these institutions will uh, kind of forge. And uh, next five years that should happen. And then 
with this uh, 16 percent to 100 percent uh, a new network should be formed to undertake. So, one can be critical of this planning commission document, but still when it is talking about revamping of the science education system in the country, it is looking at the whole country and it is giving you a three stage way of doing it. You may agree or may not agree, uh, but there is a clear plan uh, put forward in this document. Now, what is happening in these initiatives is that, they are, that that one is talking only about tier 1. Nobody is talking about tier 2 and tier 3. So, on the based on this document, you create elite institutions, few of them and you are very happy about them, but you do not even talk about how are you going to connect with tier 2 and tier 3 of the proposed revamping of the science education system. To give you some uh, numbers, see we take 1200 to 1400 students in all the Aizars in one year, 200 in Aizar Mohali. The nearby universities, since I work on their board of studies and all that, I realize we have about 100,000 students doing BSc in science in the region near Aizar Mohali. What is our plan for those? What are these 200, what grade they will do? You know, about 100,000 students. I, I did not know this number. I gathered this number, Krukshita University, Punjab University. So, I made a list how many people actually do BSc, this is about a lakh and we will come to that. I mean, then one question is that these 200 that we have, is it really the most talented uh, Nobel quality material, Nobel laureate uh, material which has been filtered out and those lakh are a class apart? The answer is no. This is not the most uh, talented uh, set that we are training in these 200, so that we justify concentrating all the resources here. You go and talk to those 1 lakh which I do, many of them are equally bright as our students. Just that they are sitting in a college doing BSc, there is certain uh, process through which you join these elite institutions. Uh, now, PhDs, postdoc, faculty, uh, there are similar numbers one can talk about, how many college faculty we have, how many university scientists we have and so on. And we talk about a ratio of 1 is to 10 student to teacher ratio, UGC talk about 1 to 25, but the data from colleges say that it is like 1 to 60. So, student to teacher ratio in colleges in science department is 1 to 60, even when you include the ad hoc faculty and all that that they hire. Okay? So, that is where the actual uh, numbers is. As I mentioned, large number of science departments have only one or two faculty left. Okay, the science department with two faculty members are considered fortunate these days in colleges. So, uh, my main thesis therefore is that these institutions will have a linear impact. They are very good, they are doing very well. I am working in one of them. I was party to setting up uh, one of them from day one. We are doing very well means we have faculty who will build good careers, get awards, do good science, write papers. But the impact is going to be proportional to the number of faculty that we have. Similarly, we are going to produce very good graduates and they will do well, but again the effect is going to be proportional to the number of graduates that we produce. And you see, uh, I mentioned to you this number is very small because when you choose bright of the bright, elite of the elite and put so much uh, money into it, you want exponential impact. You do not want linear impact from these institutions. Expected impact is exponential, but uh, the way they are currently set up, they are, they are doing very well and they will have a linear impact. Now, why is it, what, where is the problem? I think problem is the policy and design. They are designed as regular institutions with good curriculum, this, that and so on, but no system in place for actually acting as, uh, mm, you know, mm, uh, centers which will uh, come up with the new science education in the country. They are not designed in that way. Faculty are not evaluated for their contribution. Faculty are evaluated, okay, did you write a nature paper or this paper or that paper, very regular. So, there is no, there are no centers in these institutions to actually do research uh, on education and science education and all that and on and the kind of things I was talking about in the beginning, do we need to broaden the notion of literacy and science and all that and so nothing. So, they are regular, so they will have and, and also the mindset, I mean, uh, once you have people whom you, uh, who are standard and if you want them to do non-standard kind of stuff, you have to change the aims and goals. Nothing of that has been done and therefore, uh, this is the main, main problem. So, the way forward I think uh, is that we must design motives for exponential impact 
and uh, horizontal and vertical movement has to be built in which means these institutions must connect with universities colleges all institutions around as a matter of policy not as a matter that oh we are very magnanimous and you know we will have some college teachers come and attend some lectures here and we are doing a favor to them it is not like that it should be as per design uh, excellence equity and accountability should become principles instead of merit I mean, what is this merit? I, I, I original actually instead of A forward, the original title was myth of merit. So we must uh, think about new categories. Similarly, we must new, think about new categories of measuring societal development, and uh, mm, that's a broad issue. But one could be how diverse things people are able to choose uh, when they are young, how how forced they are, and how free they are in terms of the choices that they make. Uh, instead of saying always talking about consumption in, in models based on that and we should move away from information and knowledge based merit tests and devise diverse methods to identify talent and we must do research on all this it's not that i know i mean these are the issues on which these institutions should begin doing research actually that how to do uh, do all this and therefore, my, uh, well, this is maybe my last slide. There was one more which I'm not going to talk about. So my conclusion is that uh, it's a very complex situation at the moment. On the one hand, higher education public system appears to be getting dismantled by departments not having money, new recruitments and all that and so on. On the other hand, these new initiatives are coming up and they are being sold as, uh, you know, the magic solution to problems of Indian science. Uh, and so on. Uh, I think they are going to have a very good positive impact, but proportional to their size. That whole idea that they will crystallize, uh, the, 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 they, will, they, they will sow the seeds of this uh, exponential change in the, in the way science is taught and practiced and so on and so forth can happen if we transform the way these institutions are set up and built into their system the capacity and ability to carry out uh, this kind of work. Thank you. Um, so, when you, you presented the issues in science education, my fundamental problem with uh, science and technology education and Indian context is uh, science education has uh, perpetuated and transmitted the notion of ableism uh, wherein only people who are I am not talking about intellectual ableism also, but physical ableism. So when we analyze the, the human resources, the minds that come into science education and science department, they do not encourage uh, students with disabilities in general and visually impaired students in particular to pursue careers in science and technology. Um, why, what is more uh, worrisome is that even the engineering disciplines, especially computer science and IT engineering disciplines, do not have components of assistive technology uh, designing and, uh, you know, designing and developing or innovation for assistive technology in their curriculums. So, when we look, it's not only about, uh, you mentioned point, uh, that equi excellence, equity and accountability should be the guiding principles. When would the science education in India uh, would be inclusive of students with disabilities in terms of curriculum, in terms of pedagogy and methods, in terms of uh, teaching learning methods? that is going to be adopted. Yeah, so very quick response. Uh, I don't disagree with you, but this is just one thing you pointed out. 
the whole system is kind of the the the, the ocean, notion of equity is missing in in so many different in so many different dimensions rural versus urban high caste versus low caste english speaking versus non english speaking yeah i completely agree with you that our society is very an education system is also very strongly ridden with actually i pointed out even more fundamental the, even the notion of literacy is kind of biased so i don't disagree with you but i would say this is one of the dimensions of lack of equity and inclusiveness and it, it, there are so many other dimensions and together we need to grapple with this but i agree with you yeah, I, was, I was just thinking you know in which country can i think of a model which which doesn't have a kind of elitist conception of higher education where you don't have elite institutions you know, it's, it's quite napoleonic MIT and the other universities, or it's the Ecole Polytechnique person. So let me ask the counterfactual: What happens if we did? What will happen if we don't have the IITs and the ISRs? Yeah, yeah there will be. No, no. There are two parts to uh, your question. So let me first uh, respond to the first part. Now, I nowhere said that we should not have elite institutions. I thought there's a mic. No. Oh, I should use this one. Okay. Maybe I was using this all along, and that was not working. Okay. Yeah, so point is if you have elite institutions, then the, the way they are set up should be different. That is the point I was trying to make. So that they have impact which is not really just proportional to their size. I mean impact of the, the uh, elite institutions you mentioned is not proportional to their size, it is much more in the society in which they are embedded. So that is one aspect. Other one is more, more interesting and <laughs> on the lighter side I would say that uh, you kind of uh, remove vice chancellors, what impact it will have on the universities <laughs> and uh, typically not much. Universities can run without vice chancellors. So, uh, so <laughs> I do not know about your university, but most places <laughs> I visit. So, the point is that, yeah. So, if you did not have uh, IITs, I do not think we would, would have suffered uh, a big crisis. Although in countries like Pakistan, they do say that, you know, India has IITs and we do not have, uh, there is some discourse. We would have, uh, I think we would have uh, benchmarked engineering education not much more badly than what we have done now. At least we would not have JE, we would not have this global myth of merit prevailing and lots of people kind of, you know, spending three, four years of their life in a non-creative way trying to get into IITs and so on. So that, so there has been a positive impact also, but there has been a negative impact also. So I think kind of it balances because what would have then happened was, uh, for example, if Iser was not there, I will be in a university. So, all those people who are now in IITs, professors would have been in universities. So, instead of saying universities have, are bad, I mean, then we would have been kind of together. And in that together, we would have also, I think, found a, a reasonable solution to our problems and maybe a better solution to our problems, if you ask. I think that's all we have the time. Thank you, Arvind. Organizer, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
have been written exclusively for the agricultural science community for almost 15 years of my life, and realizing that nobody in the agricultural sciences are, would read anything that I've written. So um, it's it's actually a few heterodox economics uh, people, um, a few civil society organizations, farming communities, a few farmers who've read my work, um, and some scientists, some, some people who are doing basic science. So um, my readership has been entirely, well, let's say, misfired. So therefore, the fake scientist, um, <laughs> well, heading. Um, now, uh, what I want to say today, I, I thought I would say something very radical and, uh, you know, would be very negative about science, and I was very worried when I came here because this is about live streaming and whatnot, um, but I realized I'm perhaps going to be the, the only one defending science today. So, <laughs> may, I, may I just just start by saying that, uh, that uh, you know, um, the, the, this, the, I put Bernal and Polanyi here as and Polanyi, to say that this debate about Bernal versus Polanyi is something that is that is perhaps completely wrong because both of them, both Bernal and Polanyi, wanted the sciences to well inform policy and work with the state as in but using the principles of science. They they both agreed that it had to be the principles of science that would actually I'm going to see the screen. Is this that's okay. You just, you just keep it going. Okay. Okay. So um, I, I wanted to begin by by emphasizing this that that when we say knowledge and institutions and we say knowledge has to have a, a, a or has a social contract um, and that 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 the autonomy of knowledge has to be has to be well let's say um, emphasized over time. Um, different organizations and the ways in which we design ourselves. But we often miss, miss this point that um, that when science become, becomes, let's say, enslaved to certain institutions, we actually lose both the, the, well, let's say, the social contract and the content of science. So in some of the work that, that we've done, we've actually argued that the biggest impact of, of the Green Revolution, which perhaps did feed the country, and, and well, we know that there have been successes in production at least in the 1980s, the first phase of the Green Revolution, as Palasa would put it, till the mid-1980s, did actually have a revolutionary increase in production and productivity, and did feed our people. Now, that first phase actually led to the biggest negative impact of the Great Revolution, which is a complete destruction, deprivation, and actually an, an increasing irresponsibility of the agricultural sciences. And this is something that I want to speak on and um, want to emphasize the fact that it is the institutionalization of science. Oops, it's just no signal. Sorry. Um, so, um, for me, I just, before before I begin this hour or before I get to this this slide, I just want to want to ask um, specifically about about the about how many of us would see institutions um, as rules, norms, and habits of thought, um, and how many of us would see institutions as organizations? Because right at the very first presentation, you heard um, summits talk about institutions as organizations. And may I make this, this distinction very clear that I'm not talking about organizations. So when we talk about an institution, let's say, like um, marriage or the, 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 the statutes of, of a university, those are institutions. And the family or the university is the organization. So please let's make that make that very clear. So when I say the institutionalization of science, I don't mean the existence of science within within an organization, but the ways in which these, well, let's say, the organizations of science are governed by the institutions, or, or let's say the norms in which science exists in our society, and the norms that govern its social contract in terms of development imperatives. Yeah. So. Um, let me begin with, uh, with I mean, having made this this point that, that it's often we misread Bernal and Polanyi as Bernal versus Polanyi, but it's actually a debate about Bernal and Polanyi, both demanding the increasing scientization of development. And unfortunately, what, what the scientization of development has done has has not been, well, let's say, um, in, in many ways a positive impact for science, but has been a, a usage or a utilitarian 
content of, of, of science. It is that the science becomes one of the tools that, that certain actors in development or let's say leading thinkers of development have tended to use science as an input into their visions of development. Um, in some cases, in some, of course, in most cases, science has contributed to it too. So, um, may I begin with, with, the, with one of the biggest crises that we're facing now in terms of food, agriculture, and nutrition in this country in particular, but globally too. I mean, let's look at the global, global hunger or, or let's say global deprivation within farming communities. We had, we had a very, very visionary statement um, in, and I picked this for a, for a very specific reason. Um, um, a quote from Professor V. K. R. V. Rao, who was one of the founders of, of many, um, well, um, economics, well, social science research labs, basically economics. Um, again, somebody who's also evolved, um, somebody who actually founded um, an institute called Institute of Economic Growth and ended up founding, in a, uh, many, after many others, ended up founding an institute called Institute for Social and Economic Change. So here's somebody who's actually evolved in his understanding of what knowledge could do um, and what knowledge was needed in this country. So his, this quotation from, from one of his works in 1982 is something that asks for a, 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 sorry, um, a policy for food, agriculture, and nutrition, which I've kind of given an acronym as FAN, as India's Food, Agriculture, and Nutrition Policy, which is quite contrary to what we see as India's food policy, agricultural policy, or its nutrition policy. What he wants is, well, if you do apply a Bucky and Pentadic of act, actor, or agency, uh, purpose, context, um, and, and um, well, um, and, and basically the, the ways in which the, the demand is made, you see that, that, that the demand is not for producing, well, X number of tons of food grain or maximizing food grain production. The demand is not for so many numbers of people to be given so many kilocalories of food. The demand is for, or let's say the policy is for minimizing nutritional inequalities among people. And the agency that he has is, is basically a policy, or, or let's say um, the, the context is one of, of a decentralized uh, action, taking full account of local resources, availabilities, cost preferences, and traditions. Um, and again, the, the, the agency is, of course, that, that of knowledge, but again, knowledge of of both agriculture, food, and all three, agriculture, food, and nutrition. Um, why is this, this quotation important? Because it, de it deploys a completely different, well, let's say, institutional mechanism, that is, the rules, norms, ways of working that this, this demand, that this policy demand, is something that's completely different from what we've institutionalized and the content of something we have in alternative institutions. That so institutions we, we know, know have always evolved with knowledge. So if we look at if we look at the ways in which institutions as in as in rules, norms, and habits of thought that have evolved over time, and the content of of, of knowledge in the agricultural uh, well um, systems that have evolved over time, we find that um, um, well as we started as 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 um, well let's say hunter gatherers, people who've been uh, well accessing food through various um, let's say endosomatic sources that is within our bodies as a species how we access food um, we we've seen how systems evolve from the biophysical realities the rules and norms that govern these societies to settled well agriculture and also a, a settled agriculture which was led by very different kinds of people women um, different kinds of organizational systems uh, different rules and norms for collecting and storing food Again, how wheat domesticated us, and this is again something, some of the new, new kind of uh, literature that's emerging, um, that about how wheat and some domestic animals domesticated us, and not that we domesticated them. That, that is, the ways in which our rules and norms evolved in response to certain biophysical realities. Now, knowledge has, has been, well, let's say, growing through all this, and has been, well, let's say, uh, has had a very very concrete and substantive linkage between the hand and the head through all these systems, through all these well, evolutions that you've seen in, in, in agriculture. But as the agricultural sciences or the sciences um, become, well, let's say, institutionalized, organized for production and, and again, organized for a very, very um, concentrated, um, well, um, structures of production knowledge or, or, let's say, knowledge for production, agricultural production, uh, what happens is that there's, there's a changing rationality that comes in. 
starting with, with questions of how do you reduce drudgery to questions of how do you understand soils, how do you put in more, more, more resources or more manure for, for, or how do you reclaim certain soils, whether it is guano or the, or the, or the, Indian, or the English agricultural revolution. There is a, an evolution of, of the nature of, again, what Sawin was talking about, the kind of funding, for instance, whether it's Bosingol's experiments or Liebig's experiments or, or the first production of, of, of phosphates from, from Gilbert and Laws. Um, there is an institutionalization of, of the relationship between knowledge and agricultural production that is through certain patrons, maybe private patrons, maybe a set of, set of uh, well, lords or, uh, you know, landlords um, enabling institutionalized or rich farmers so there are there are these slogans that you hear in in, in Europe and, and France and Germany in England where the institutionalization of agricultural science for production happens um, slogans like knowledge for 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 um, knowledge for profit um, knowledge for power you know all these kinds of slogans come about and Public funding of agricultural science also starts, again, public funding of agricultural science starts in, in, in uh, back home in, in Britain many years after it starts in, in India, of course, in the colonial government found a desire to institutionalize uh, public sector agricultural science in India much earlier because, of course, they had an economic interest here. What happens in the 1940s and, and with the evolution of, of let's say, post-World War agriculture and post-World War industrial production is um, an increasing industrial appropriation and substitution of biological production. You find that almost 80%, 90% of the chemical energy that goes into agriculture gets appropriated by industry and states, as in elected democratic governments, enable or fund knowledge generation for this. That is, that is, that is, that becomes, well, let's say, what they call development. That is, development is the increasing industrial appropriation and substitution of biological production. And <coughs> as this progresses, I mean, from the 1950s, maybe, 1960s, with the revolution and the onset of a whole range of inputs that come in from the US, the Technological Cooperation Mission, and then the USAID, um, a whole range of other, well, mechanisms of company, including, including some fertilizer, uh, well, industry that came in with 100% FDI. Uh, it's not that FDI is anything new to this country. We've had FDI and, and, and those kinds of uh, well, inputs throughout our history. Now, what, what happens is, is this, this institutionalization of science within this development agenda, within the, well, acknowledged and accepted within economic theory, within mainstream development economics, as um, an input for development and industrial appropriation and substitution of biological production becomes institutionalized in planned development, um, what you see is an increasing, well, um, impact on agriculture, or let's say what, what I've called agriculture and the development burden that increases over time. And what happens to science as a consequence is that science becomes enslaved to a development agenda. And it's very sad when you see science of the sort. And many of, uh, in, 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 in many forums that I've spoken, and when scientists have questioned this, um, I've had to point out with examples within the content of, of soil science, within the content of genetics, within the content of, of soil physics, I mean, in, in particular. Um, there, are, there are cases where you can actually illustrate where this, the, the agenda that, that has been with the sciences to do certain kinds of science is given up to cater to a productivity argument or to something that will allegedly lead to a particular development output because those are the ways in which it has been institutionalized. Not because the content of science is actually says, uh, is actually telling you, or the context is telling you that you should work on this. So science under siege is something again that I've used in some work that I've run earlier. Um, so if we, if we look at science under siege, I mean the best example is the 1980s. Let's look at some of the modern debate now and debates now and go back to the 1980s and say, did we have the evidence then I mean, about the rapid and, and persistent decline of incremental output to unit use of fertilizer? Did we have it in the 19? Yes, we did. This is fertilizer use efficiency from the fertilizer association of India, from the producers and defenders of chemical fertilizers. These are people who desperately want fertilizer use efficiency, efficiencies to increase they desperately want people to buy more fertilizers. They do want India to use more chemical fertilizers. And still, this is the evidence that they give. Yeah? So it's not that evidence was lacking. So what did we do? What did our sciences do to improve 
fertilizer use efficiency. They, there were a few experiments. There still are a few experiments. Unfortunately, they are all institutionalized within a particular paradigm of science, within a particular way of organizing, or certain, within certain institutions of science. That is, what is expected of science, what is done as the content of science, is dictated by certain rules and norms which have nothing actually to do with the content of science, but have been well, dictated to us by a particular development paradigm. Development as in, well, the demonstration effect of industrialized countries, the monocultures there, the ways in which they have produced and they have allowed the industrial appropriation of production systems. Rebu spoke about, about um, well, China moving increasingly to, to high-tech sectors and, uh, and uh, well, you know, what will their low-skilled low workers, cheap labor do. I mean, yes, China will face a crisis now. China's probably realizing that it's facing an increasing crisis with production returning home to, well, clean production returning. They've, they've of course, the West has exported a lot of polluting industries to the third world. We've received many of them, happily. We're still asking for more. But um, we we know that, 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 well, once robotics, that's perhaps what what is what is the interest of what that is perhaps the key driver that Japan wants um, more labor for um, from India. Uh, but uh, wait, wait. So so, so the the, the uh, China will face an increasing crisis as the world shifts to robotics and clean production goes back to 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 the industrialized countries um, because their their biological production systems will suffer just like ours is now because there is there is going to be an increasing inability to cater to the, de the industrial demands of or industrial output demands of the, of the developed world. Why, why is this this important to us as biological production systems? What does this evidence tell us about about um, about where we should be heading in terms of the content of science? I mean, in terms of the content of science. Well, in some sense, autonomous or independent of what Bernal calls the, the social contract of science, that is, science catering to development as development imagined by certain actors who've been given to certain, well, demonstration effects or, or a desperate desire to become as, um, well, climb the ladder like um, the, the um, like developed countries have. So we need a different development imagination, and that's possible. Some of us have been, uh, in, uh, have been well, let's say, doing work with with uh, various groups. I've listed a few of these here, India's questions on India's soils, um, IIT Delhi, Shinara University, and the revitalization of Rainford Agriculture Network. There's a global 4,000 initiative that's been launched from France, and that's a really interesting initiative where each one of us can individually do something to enrich soil carbon. Um, FAO 2015, um, International Year of Soils, some of these slides were presented there too. So um, the question of what evidence has done to rethinking science or well, let's say reinvesting in science and the content of science and reimagining development says that there's very little that evidence has contributed. There's very little maneuverable room that science has had. Today, the biggest evidence that we have, 2017, um, well, India's um, hunger and malnutrition index. Let's recall Amartya Sen's famous statement that hunger and malnutrition are a moral outrage given the, despite the productive capacities that we have now. The biggest question is, is it because of or despite the productive capacities, or is it because of productive capacities? Is it because science has failed to deliver the right kind of production capacities that are needed, the right kind of responsible innovation that is needed, or is it because science has just paid lip service to, well, a certain development agenda that's been given to us? Um, I've been telling my students that, you know, you guys are going to face a major problem when you recruit people, because 38% of, of what you recruit will be stunted material. Sorry. It's very, very painful, but we have to realize that, that my students now, who are in their 20s now, will be recruiting, well, from a really bad pool, sad pool. How did we get there? There is a big corpus of international literature, international Indian, third world, global south, call it whatever you will, on how we got there, the relationship between agricultural science, technology, and development. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to skip this because this is this is actually something that's that's from a couple of things that we've written and also worked on as part of an international assessment of agricultural science technology for development. Um, basically, arguing that that we've been through all these critiques and every every step what you see as from the 90, chronologically is actually just one step in the technology treadmill. We're not stepping out of the institutionalization of 
development and institutionalization of science within that development paradigm, within a particular kind of agriculture, a Rostovian model of, uh, of sequential growth. Um, to continue this, um, this is the way we, we are now. We've, we're facing a whole range of well, alternatives that have come. Some have come in with, with studies of ecology, good governance, social production, protection, and so on. But here, in all these, what you see is that science is doing just the same thing. It's investing in increasing production and productivity, even when there, are, when there are second generation problems, which is what agricultural science has always told us. They invest in solutions that are just part of the same paradigm. And the content of science, again, if we have time, we'll talk about that. So there are alternatives that actually ask or enable people to look outside the box. Works like here in India, Professor Amulya Reddy, George Skirojan, and there are many people who spoke about, uh, well, actually not just about, about the kind of energy and, and production relations, but also about the nature of science that goes into these. That is, it's not just about rural industrialization, Amulya Reddy wanted appropriate technology and so on. But he was also asking us about the nature of science, the nature of knowledge that goes into these production systems. And when you institutionalize science in a particular way, Science has no other alternative but to do just what is what is demanded of, of or let's say what that what those organizations are designed for, what are the rules and norms that, that dictate well, the structures of the organizations and the role of science within that. So this is uh, just an illustration from, from what what to the alternatives to a life science-based production systems approach or a knowledge-based bioeconomics approach. Um, that there are alternatives, and there are alternatives that are living right now. I mean, whether it's a Timbuktu collective or the Via Campesina or any of these alternatives, there are many, many alternatives in agriculture. The Sun Commune in, in China. There are many examples that are actually showing us how the the problem statements, the resource constraints, the kind of knowledge, and all these have a different institutional makeup that is rules, norms that govern their existence and the ways in which they relate to markets uh, as consumers. Yeah. Um, so if we actually want the sciences to cater to food, agriculture, and nutrition in a linked way, that is, minimizing nutritional inequalities, as what Professor Rao had demanded, um, we need a different kind of science, obviously. We need a, 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 a context that is a contextual understanding of the prevalent agri-food regimes and their values. Why are they different? This is again Harry Friedman's, Michael Phillips, and their, their kind of work, which argues that the kind of agri-food regimes we have now with their vertical value chains and their decomposable units of commodities don't allow us to even have a right kind of problem statement about the energy flows. Agriculture today, allegedly primary producer. What is a primary producer? A primary producer is some, something that harvests the abundant energies that the sun gives us or resources and it produces additional energy, right? Agriculture today is a net energy guzzler and is not a net energy producer, which it was for millennia since you human beings started well, cultivating or using biological production systems. So we need a different kind of uh, well, problem statement and get away from this institutionalization of life science-based value chains of decomposable units and move towards knowledge-based bioeconomies of value networks, some of which Raghu was speaking about, value networks where employment, that is, we're not looking at 9 billion mouths to feed, which is a rhetoric that we've been fed endlessly. We, we're looking at 18 billion hands to work. There are opportunities there. We have, to, we have to create value networks and, again, lateral systems of engaging with knowledge, not just scientific knowledge. So we need a science that shifts from speaking truth to power, that is speaking to these development thinkers and policy makers and so on. Some of us, some of them are, of course, scientists themselves, who's, well, moving upwards, upward mobility is actually getting into positions of power and becoming bureaucrats themselves. Um, so science speaking to, to, to power, move to a position of making sense together. Get to work with other knowledge systems, get to work with other actors, acknowledge the inequalities that exist in our society, acknowledge that we can actually make a difference as scientists, instead of, well, serving under uh, well, a development regime that has put, put us under siege. So we need to, uh, this is again coming from an economist who's devoted his entire life, over 45 years of relentless publications, Vernon Rutten, supporting the Green Revolution, supporting everything that, that this irrigation, chemical intensive, biological production system has done. So he's written endlessly about that. In a speech that he gave in 2005 to the American Philosophical Transactions, Society of Philosophical Transactions, 
Um, he spoke about how we need a science, an agricultural science that would move away from this life science-based system and would actually focus on an a set of institutional innovations and in learning that can actually revamp the science to building secure bridges between the island empires of agriculture, health, and environment, and he illustrates a few of these. So um, we actually need a science that can actually challenge the current limits of the co-evolution and complexity of knowledge, Norbert's work, which talks about how industrial societies are unable to respond to the five or four or five different systems that are co-evolving with us. Climate change is the biggest example of this. But the loss of biodiversity, or let's say the other seven planetary limits that we have transcended already, are proof of our inability to respond in a co-evolutionary fashion to the other systems. We are responding only to price signals. We are responding only to signals of scarcity within a minor component of our economy. And sciences have a much greater moral role than to respond to these minuscule concerns about, you know, I mean, even, sorry, some, and even questions of funding for science. People have done good science with absolutely no funding. That that kind of science has disappeared, I agree with Erwin. That kind of science has disappeared, we need a different, but there is a different set of knowledge systems where science can engage meaningfully. And I sincerely hope that this dialogues and everything that we have on board today will encourage us to do that. Thank you. idea of uh, you have talked about why science should not be institutionalized particularly agriculture science you talked about institutions and organizations you talked about organizations are different whereas the moment you move into institutions you are bound by rules and set of norms and so on and so forth uh, there are various facts and figures which can be analyzed in one way or the other. Agriculture is a very complicated subject. Perhaps there are not many agricultural scientists having spent 40 years in agriculture. We do understand a little bit. And I do understand that agriculture science should be dealt in a, perhaps in a different manner than any, say, physics or chemistry or mathematics. Because it is an amalgamation of all the science that you can think of, whether it is biology, whether it is chemistry, whether it is physics, any science you can think of, it is an amalgamation of that. But more importantly, that it has to be dealt so differently in terms of uh, developmental plans because we are talking, talking about social contract of science. And nothing is more uh, integrated than agriculture in that sense. And uh, therefore, perhaps I was only thinking that perhaps too simplistic uh, uh, analysis may actually be misleading that whatever happened is, I mean, whatever adverse impacts we are seeing is because A, B, C. It's much more complicated than that. Because agriculture policy or agriculture science policies had always been totally disconnected, devoid of the country's overall developmental policies to start with. Whether you're talking about the land grabs, use of different modes of different sources of energies, or why the, the focus was in the 50s of uh, managing the hunger. And now once we have managed hunger, we are able to think about managing 
nutrition, which is the right approach. But then, um, it's you know, it's it's like this, Rajeshwari, that we all know that every time we are using our cars and we are leaving so many carbon footprints, and yet all of us cannot go back to cycling all the time in our lives. It's not possible, so it is not possible. Similarly, in agriculture science, and more so in agriculture science, it is not as simple or black and white that you take this path or you take that path. So we have to think in totality, and unless there is an institutional mechanism, at least in, in whichever way, I have full, I fully agree with you that perhaps the way we went about it perhaps was not the right one. But unless you have some mechanism to provide you a, a plan or a road map which will give you a long term a sustainable agricultural mechanism, there won't be any. There won't be any, believe me. I mean, just going back to older uh, systems of agriculture is not a solution. An early 1950s film, Dobi Hazameen, many of you must have seen, and you have seen the plight of the farmer 60 years back. Haven't we moved forward? If we haven't, at least we have been able to provide food to five times more population. At some, there will always be, uh, I mean, you'll have to pay back. Now is the time, because at that time, the plans were short term. So I agree that we must have a long term, long term plan for sustainable agriculture. But unless there is any institution to provide that, any mechanism to prepare a plan, I think we will go nowhere. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I, I kind of agree with you, but I just just, just have one. May I ask, ask a question in return, ma'am? Yes, yeah, sure. Uh, is this sustainable agriculture, sustainable agricultural production? Mm -hmm. No, okay. No, then, then I have then I have a couple of couple of points to make about about the inability of the agricultural sciences to actually respond to well the complexity that agriculture is about yes. and the inability of the ways in which it is been institutionalized. I've never I've never said in this presentation that we need to go back to well living in caves or cycling or anything. We might have to do that as systems change and as, as fuels become become more expensive. But the point is that that there are alternatives that are decentralized short value chains giving people jobs and higher value added in location specific systems. The, you look at the Berkshires, the Bristol case, the, the cases in, in, in Karnataka, the cases in Andhra where there are small value chains that are doing this very effectively. So in terms of knowledge also, we need to think of China has 17,000 municipal, municipal science commissioners. That is, the municipality has science commissioners who enable the linkage between, well, what Bhatnagar lamented in 1943, the linkage between actual industrial use of knowledge and, well, the, the knowledge that's created at the universities. So enabling these. So there are alternatives that are possible, and the agricultural sciences today are not engaging with either the complexity and are far, far away from the kind of integration that we need. And um, I mean, I have about 25 odd publications which, which talk about these things. I've not yeah. referred to any of these here. But the point is that um, if there's anything that this, that this presentation is not, it is, it is not simplistic. I was worried it was a bit too, a bit too well, uh, you know, complex for that. So it's, it's, not, it's definitely not simplistic. And I definitely am not going to take this position that, that agriculture should not be institutionalized. And that's not what I was saying that agriculture needs institutionalization of a very different sort. A knowledge-based bioeconomic paradigm, which the European Union is incidentally experimenting with. So we can think of that, and we can actually find alternatives to that. Just one more word. Sure. Let's not just be uh, following the European model or the Chinese model. Indian model has to be Indian. Arvind, one quick one. So this uh, <coughs> locus of change in thinking this locus of change in thinking 
Where do you think it will come from? Will it come from the community of agricultural scientists or performing uh, farmers or from social scientists? What do you think will kind of uh, crystallize this uh, change in thinking about agricultural sciences or agricultural technologies, I would say? Um, well, I mean, there, there, are, uh, there are a few agricultural scientists, as in people who, are, who actually work with the sciences and actually en engage with technologies that farmers use also. So there are some of them who are contributing to this, this question of change too. But um, the locus of change is coming largely from, from well, um, fortunately or unfortunately, from the Indian middle class, um, from farming communities who are actually enabling some changes. I mean, farmers who are refusing to use certain kinds of, uh, well, um, certain paradigms in, in production, uh, whether it's question of pests or chemicals, and um, they have seeking alternatives, and uh, there is a change that's happening. And there are millions of cases of, of successes. There are websites that list many of these. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, don't be scared. There is no presidential speech. 